Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our uh, rather strange service. This is very odd. I've only got an empty church, and I've got one, two, three, four people just looking at me this morning. But, uh, and also, it's Friday evening, but we are actually putting this out on Sunday morning. I'm Jonathan Perkett. I'm the vicar here, and it's lovely to speak to you this morning, at least, even if I can't see you. And in particular, very happy Mother's Day. Uh, lovely, all you dear mums, we love you and we're wishing you a happy Mother's Day. Uh, before we start, I just want to read this uh, confession, which is what we would normally do on a Sunday morning. And uh, so let me just do this confession, and you may want to sort of echo these words yourself at home. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through our weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. So may Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now we're following a, a sermon series on the churches in the book of Revelation, and we've come now to the fifth church, which is the church in Sardis. So let me read this passage to you from Revelation chapter 3 and the first six verses. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember therefore what you've received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you don't wake up, I will come like a thief and you'll not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I'm sure you've all uh, heard the phrase, a wake-up call. Uh, It can be rather mundane, like uh, you ask your hotel to give you a wake-up call because you've got an early flight or an important meeting. But usually it's something much more serious than that. Uh, Here is what somebody has quoted. Sometimes it takes a wake-up call to alert us to the fact that we're hurrying through life instead of actually living it. That we're living in the fast life instead of the good life. And I think for many people that wake-up call takes the form of an illness. Well, Jesus comes to this very small church in Sardis and says to them in verse 2, wake up. Uh, I think there are two things to bear in mind about this whole thing of being asleep. Uh, The first is we don't know we're asleep when we're asleep. Usually we're totally, literally out of it. We don't know that we're asleep until, of course, we wake up. And the second thing is we don't like being woken up. It's uh, usually rather rude, rather irritating, disturbing, and uncomfortable. Who likes being woken up by the alarm clock? But Jesus says to us, wake up. And don't we realize that we're asleep? Don't be surprised if you feel a bit annoyed at being told to wake up. You may think, well, I'm not asleep. And Jesus says, really? 
Well, I think that in this season, we are in a wake-up call. Whatever else is going on, and one doesn't want to guess the mind of God, but certainly this is a wake-up call. God doesn't send this virus, but for whatever reason, He's allowed it to happen. And this virus has taken us all by surprise. This isn't an illness in some far-off land. This is something which is happening probably in our very street. Well, what was the danger in Sardis? Was it a lack of love like in Ephesus? No. Was it persecution in Smyrna? No. Was it like a heretical teaching as in Pergamum? No. Was it outright immorality like Thyatira? No. In fact, they seemed the model church. They were wealthy. Everything was going well. It wasn't like the churches down the road in Ephesus or Smyrna. But Jesus tells them that they're dead. In verse 2, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. They have a great reputation. It's a model church in the diocese. Lovely buildings, lots of youth turning up, vibrant worship. But their reputation was this. Wow, this is a live church to come and join. It's all a bit near the bone, isn't it? Or maybe our greatest danger is not from outside attack, not from wrong teaching or immorality, but simply from sleep, complacency, apathy, boredom, same old, same old. And Jesus says, wake up, wake up. I wonder whether we sense the urgency. Have we taken things for granted? Have we taken food and health and fun for granted? Have we, do we think to ourselves that we can control everything? Do we have presumption about our plans? It wasn't very long ago that whenever you had a plan for something, people would usually add the phrase, God willing. But we don't really say that these days, do we? Or maybe we're just lulled into a false sense of security. Well, the failing of Sardis was complacency. It looked good, it sounded good, it felt good, but they were asleep. And that was actually very pertinent to Silas because twice in their history they'd been taken by surprise by enemies and overrun simply because their guards were asleep. What does it feel like to be asleep? Well, I think it's summed up in the word casual. Casual about prayer, casual about reading our Bibles, casual about worship, casual about turning up to church or to a connect group, You know, we might turn up, what, one Sunday in four, perhaps two. Casual about tithing, casual about most of the disciplines and the practices of the Christian life. Well, in verse 2, Jesus says, For I have not found your deeds complete. It's all rather half-baked, unfinished, token gestures, nominal adherence, incomplete. And it's this difference between what God sees and what we think is actually going on. It's the difference between reputation and actual reality, what we profess to be and what we actually are. Do you remember what God said in the Old Testament, that the Lord doesn't look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Or maybe what Jesus said, the people come near me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Or he called the religious people whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, dead on the inside. Or maybe what Paul wrote to Timothy, to beware people having a form of godliness, but denying its power. They had all the form of looking godly and religious and spiritual, But no power, no power to change lives, no power to bring people to Christ. It's form without power, reputation without reality, appearance without integrity, show without life. Uh, It's really what, in the Bible, really what is called hypocrisy, the Greek which means wearing a mask. I came across this phrase the other day, karaoke Christians just pretending to be the real thing. 
So again, maybe our greatest danger is not from outright opposition, from persecution, or from rank immorality, not from false teaching, but our greatest danger is from being asleep. That's why reality is the fifth mark of the genuine church. We've looked at love in Ephesus and perseverance. We've looked at truth. We've looked at holiness. And today it's reality. Now, if you're a sensitive Christian, of course, you'll feel slightly uncomfortable at all this because we're all aware of where we come short. We're all aware of the fact that there is a gap between what we think we are and what we actually know we are what we outwardly show to others and what we actually are. And actually in the Christian life there'll always be this incompleteness, this lacking, this hunger for more, this thirst for God, this unsatisfaction with our spiritual condition. There will always be this now and not yet gap. This is what we actually are, but we haven't yet arrived. We may want to cry with the psalmist in Psalm 63, my soul thirsts for you, my body longs for you. And that actually is always going to be the normal Christian life. But we will be challenged by this threat of hypocrisy. Am I actually trying to be something other than I actually are? And am I being honest? Am I being real? Well, the way back is an intentional Christian walk. In verse 3, remember therefore what you've received and heard, obey it, and repent. I think this is really a call to be filled afresh again with the Holy Spirit. It's time to go back to our spiritual disciplines which keep us alive in the Spirit. And I think there are two approaches to motivate people. Uh, We know this with children. If you've ever been a teacher, we know this with a classroom. There's carrot and stick. Well, the stick approach is there in verse 2 where Jesus warns them they're about to die, and in verse 3, I will come like a thief. You don't know when I'm going to come. That's the stick approach. But actually, he also uses the carrot approach, the encouraging, enticing promises, four great carrots to motivate us to change, ways to wake up. Uh, So the first carrot is in verse 4. They will walk with me. It's a great promise that Jesus gives us. It's not Jesus... Uh, walking with us, which is what he says in Psalm 23, but as w- us walking with him, as you would do with a rabbi. With a rabbi, you follow the rabbi. You walk with him. You follow him. You listen to him. You're associated with him. You're his friend, and you enjoy his presence. Or the second carrot is in verse 4, for they are worthy. They're dressed in white. As we read in Revelation chapter 7, The ones dressed in white are those that have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Which may sound rather odd phraseology. What it means is that we believe that Jesus died for us, that he's washed us clean. And we need to remember that. Then the third carrot, verse 5, I will never blot his name out from the book of life. Uh, Actually, that word never is emphatic. Never by any means whatsoever will never blot out his name from the book of life. That sense of security and certainty and assurance of our future hope and our future inheritance. Uh, I've told you the story before about once when uh, I visited the Savoy Theatre to go watch uh, a play. And it was a very warm summer's evening, so I was in a sort of open neck shirt. I wasn't wearing a jacket. And I thought I'd had about an hour to kill. I thought I'd pop into the Savoy Hotel, as one does, uh, to go and have a a quick meal at the Savoy Grill. Never been there in my life. Thought it'd be rather fun. Well, no sooner I'd arrived, I met reality. Two problems. Problem number one, my name wasn't in the reservation book. Problem number two, I wasn't wearing the right clothes. And quite rightly, I was told to go. Well, we need to have our names in the book and we need to be wearing the white clothes through faith in Jesus Christ. And then the last carrot, number five, sorry, verse five, I will acknowledge his name before my Father. Jesus says, and he comes forward, he says, this is one of mine. That for each one of us that belongs to Jesus, he before the Father and the angels, he'll say, I know this guy, I know this girl, I know this man, I know this woman. They're one of mine. I will acknowledge them 
before my Father in heaven. So, just finishing, hear what the Spirit says. He's speaking to each one of us. He's saying, wake up. This is our spiritual wake-up call. And in these days, these really weird days of uncertainty, we need to wake up and to seek Him, seek His face, be more intentional in pressing into God. Uh, as I was closing my computer this afternoon, as I pressed the button, the power button, three commands come up. Number one, sleep. Number two, shut down. Number three, restart. That's my advice. Don't go for sleep. Certainly don't go for shutdown. Keep pressing in. But go for restart to wake up to what God is doing. Shall we pray together? As the words of that song says, would you fall afresh again upon us? Spirit of God, come and blow through the caverns of our hearts and fill us again to overflow. May we wake up to what you're calling us to do in these days. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a good day.